Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's class. Um, we'll let everyone filter, sort of filter in while I, while I go live on YouTube. So one moment. I had trouble last week signing into you to YouTube, and I think that's happening again, which is okay. But let, let's uh, try it right one more time. And you know if the audio is okay. I had trouble on a call earlier. Um, okay. Well, we're not going to go live on YouTube, but that's okay. That's okay. Uh, let me know if you can hear me okay, and put, put you can put that to the chat box. Let me know if you can, can hear me. Just just type something in there. Okay. Thank you, Helen. Appreciate that. So welcome everyone. I uh, hope everyone, everyone's doing well. Tonight we're actually, we're actually going to be discussing what's called metabolic flexibility. And we, we've discussed, I've, I've discussed this before, and we're going to discuss it again because I think it's really important. And uh, I was in an article by someone in a journal called the Townsend Letter. And it really was, it was amazing. Uh, a little choppy. Um, as long as the volume is up, choppiness, Todd, uh, could be connected to the connection. So, and so hopefully that will prove. But if it, if it continues, please do let me know. Let me know. Um, so I came across this article in, in a journal called the, the Townsend Lab, which is a sort of holistic alternative medicine journal that I like to read. And there was an incredible description of, of, me of metal flexibility. I went back and I listened to my original episode on metabolic flexibility and i realized that, that this was really an incredible uh way of, of organizing and explaining the meaning the material I thought to myself that i used it sort of as an outline to to discuss metabolic flexibility in a very concise way so that you can understand it now generally speaking metabolic flexibility refers to the ability of your body to be able to burn sugar and to burn fat to be able to switch between two in such a, such a way that your body is, in a sense, from a metabolic perspective, healthy. And the reason, the reason that's important is because if your body is not capable of burning fat, then obviously you're going to be in a situation where you're continu continuously burning sugar. And what that requires, what that, that leads to in ways, uh, if you can think about it this way, is once you don't have any blood sugar, then you, you run out of fuel. your 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 blood your brain starts to starts to go, go, go you start to feel a lot of mental discomfort as well as body, body bodily discomfort and when we think about things from an evolutionary perspective we always went through periods of time where there were periods of food scarcity and we evolved evolved in such a way that our bodies are supposed to go through periods of scarcity and we evolved optimally to be able to go through those through that process. And when we go through a process of food scarcity, that means that we need to get energy from somewhere. And that energy, energy. Is, is fatty acids that are liberated from the fat. And if you aren't capable of doing that because we're, you're not metabolically flexible, metabolically healthy, then you are in a situation where you're continuously dependent on blood sugar carbohydrates to be, to be able to, to, fun, to function. Now this leads to a whole host of, of problems. One of the problems is, is that you need, you need to eat every four or five hours. Uh, there are many people th that are out there that essentially to eat every four hours or they feel very, very, very sick. And a lot of the, you know, almost all of those people are in a situ situation where they're incredibly metabolically inflexible. They're not capable of burning, switching to burning Fat. Now, if, if you are incredibly metabolically flexible, meaning you're you're just you can, you can easily switch from burning sugar to burning fat. Fat. If you miss a meal, meal, you don't feel feel all bad. You, you know, immediately your body switches into burning mode, liberating getting the fatty acids, and then you have energy to be able to to go about your day. And ultimately, because we're in this position of having food abundance, overabundance, are, are, we aren't giving our bodies the chance to, to be able to develop this flexibility. Now, when we're, when we're born and we are, are we have this right, right off the bat. So it is, is a natural state of an human affairs, natural state that we're supposed to be, be in that we have lost. Experts in this, in this field estimate that only around 10 to 20% of people in, in population are metabolically pure, 
really, really, truly metabolically flexible, which, which mean, means that you know, 70 to 80 percent of people are not metabolically flexible. Now, this, this points, points to thing that really pertains to, you, you know, a, as, as an example, if someone is metabolically flexible and they have some sweets every once in a while, it's not, it's not an issue because ultimately they know that it's good. They're going to return to a situation where their body is going to bring the fat that maybe they just put down because they had, had some, some, some extra, you know, had no had it or something, something like that, that had a lot of calories. But if you're in a situation where you're metabolically inflexible, what happens is, is, is just adding, you know, adding insult to injury in the sense that you're just perpetuating the situation. Unfortunately, you know, it's, it's, it's an, it's an unfortunate situation, but you, you get to this place where you're just stuck and that's, that stuckness leads to, to continual weight gain in continual, uh, what's called potentially leading to something, to something called metabolic syndrome, which we'll discuss in just a moment, and ultimately sort of this downward spiral until you, you really realize that you ultimately need to be able to create inside your body, a situation where you can, can burn fat. And so that's really what we are going, are going to discussing tonight. So let me share my screen and we will get started. And this amazing thing pictures, uh, I didn't take it, but it's from, from it's, they said it's, it's in Italy. So, so, uh, anyway, I just thought it was an amazing, amazing picture. All right. So let's see if I can season. I'm having trouble, uh, finding my, let's see, board. Okay. Hmm. Let's try something else else here. There we go. Okay. All right. So you should be able to see, see my screen and we're going to get started. As I mentioned, if you're interested in an amazingly succinct and, and really well-written article on metabolic flexibility to complement uh, tonight's class, you can find it on it by Googling this doctor, uh, Dr. Fernandro uh, Townsend, Townsend Lane, 2021, which was really the inspiration for, for tonight's talk. All right, blow the screen up a little bit. And essentially, you, you know what we're going to be talking about, talking about essentially it's metabolic, metabolic, metabolism and health. And metabolism is essentially, you know, you know the chemical processes in your body that make you capable of functioning and metabolizing or processing food energy in, into energy uh, so that you can be alive, basically. And we spoke essentially about how already we spoke about what metabolic, metabolic flexibility is. We'll, we'll go into a bit more detail, detail about that. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about metabolic inflexibility, some of the consequences, uh, metabolic syndrome, which is this condition that, that unfortunately a lot, a lot of have. We'll spend a little bit of time on obesity. So what are, are there, is there anything in our environment that is actually contributing to the obesity issue? And what we do about that, we spoke about that before, before uh, I did an entire talk on that, talking about different, different things, uh, lifestyle factors, and some questions to think about getting back to baseline. And what I mean by, by baseline is being able to burn sugar and being able to burn fat is something that we all need to, need to be able to like we were when, when we were babies. Um, and therefore, I call getting back to baseline. So let's start by talking about metabolic flexibility. Again, we spoke about it, how food storage was, when food is available, essentially you don't, you know, you are in a situation where your body is, is in food storage mode. In other words, an over, overabundance food is going to make a store the excess calories because evolutionarily speaking, so it's, a, it's an, an elegistim. In other words, evolutionarily, we went through periods of food abundance and then and, and food scarcity. So it makes sense that your body has built this, this incredible, incredible situation where if, if you an enormous sort of abundance of calories, calorie, that it's be, being to be stored, stored for the periods of time, time when food scarcity and you can liberate the, 
the fat that you, you've stored as energy. But as we spoke, spoke about, when there's an overabundance of food, then we get into a situation where, unfortunately, um, the, the, the balance here is, 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 is not optimal. So the utilization of food when it is not available is this, is this sort of balance that, that unfortunately we've lost, lost in the prosperity area we have where we have this overabundance of, of food. Uh, and, and you know, ultimately the issue, issue comes down to the role of insulin. Now I spoke about insulin, insulin quite a bit over, over the last couple months, I guess. Um, when insulin, now, now insulin is, is what's released when you eat carbohydrates. It's, uh, and it allows the blood blood sugar to be utilized in the cells. It also is a growth hormone. And um, so I'm getting, uh, unfortunately, getting a, a this is not that clear. Unfortunately, is is everyone else have, having having that problem? Problem. Um, let me know if the speech is is not clear. clear. I can try a different, um, okay. All right. All right. Let me try a different microphone. Phone. I can use a computer microphone. Um, okay. Okay. Give me one second here and we'll try, uh, the internal. All right. How about that? Can you hear me now? Is that any better? Let me know if that's better, much better. Okay, all right, thanks everyone. Great, all right, excellent. So getting back to what we were speaking about, thank you for commenting on that everyone, and I'm glad you can hear me better. We spoke about this situation of this elegant balance between food scarcity and food overabundance. And interestingly, you know, believe it or not, we are supposed to go through this period on a yearly basis. When you look at uh, animals, as an example, when, the, when fruit was around, they would often use fruit to be able to bulk up a little bit for the wintertime, which has led several people to caution not to eat too much fruit because fruit is actually built to you know, be a, uh, an attractive sweet, in other words, in nature, to be able to put on some extra calories before, before the winter comes so that you, you know, during the winter, of course, you would go through this period of, of food scarcity, and then you could utilize the little extra padding that you got from the fruit. So that's why some people think that you really do need to be careful um, of, of eating fruit, especially nowadays when the fruit that we have is has been not, not necessarily genetically modified in the sense, of course, there are genetically modified fruits out there, especially papaya. But ultimately, you know, the fruits are a lot bigger than they were, you know, even hundreds of years ago, apples were, you know, very small. Uh, we've grown them over years and years of, of selecting bigger fruits to get these massive, massive fruits. So, you know, you sort of have to think about it in that way. Anyway, I've totally gotten off track. So we, let me get back to the role of insulin. So insulin allows the blood sugar to get into the cells, but it's also, it's also a growth hormone and, it'll, and it also is going to facilitate putting fat down because it's a growth factor. So that's something to be aware of. Um, and obviously anything that's gonna make your blood sugar spike, as well as believe it or not, excess animal protein can raise, can raise your insulin levels. But ultimately, um, you know, it's gonna be these, the carbohydrates that are going to ultimately raise your, your insulin level. Now, the thing to remember about insulin is that when insulin is high, it breaks down an enzyme called lipase, which allows you to break down fat. So in other words, higher the insulin, the lower the lipase, so the lower your ability to break down fat. So ultimately, when I have patients uh, that I'm helping with, with weight loss, as an example, one of the blood tests that I really like to get is insulin because it gives you a general indicator of, of your ability to break down fat. And therefore, when someone sees that, when a patient sees their insulin level is elevated, then we can sort of work on that in the sense of under, you know, teaching the patient what's going on with this, with this insulin. And it's very helpful for them to be, able, to be able to track. So ultimately we get to a point where we start seeing the insulin levels drop 
And then of course, that means your body is capable of burning fat. When your insulin levels are sky high, unfortunately, even in a period, unfortunately, even in a period of, of you know, reduction of, of calories and eating it, you know, eating the calories that normally would lead you to get to a point of your optimal weight, it could be prevented because of, the, of this insulin being elevated. Um, now, I, I want to also mention that when we're unable, when I'm unable to get an insulin level, I really recommend that people get a glucometer uh, that diabetics use to check your blood sugar. Now, I recommend something called Keto Mojo, which is something that, which is a glucometer, so glucometer measuring glucose, but it also measures ketone levels. And the reason I, I recommend that is because let's say you do, let's say you decide to do a 24 hour fast. We'll talk about fasting in just a moment. You want to know if you, if your body is capable of starting to burn fat and measuring ketones is one way to be able to, to see if you're burning, burning fat. Um, if you're able to liberate ketones, then it means you're liberating fatty acids, which means you're burning fat. So having a glucometer like, like the one that I have by a company called Keto Mojo can allow you one to check, you know, during a fat, during just a 24 hour fast, uh, or even if you are getting to a point where you're starting to lengthen the amount of time between your, your last meal and your first meal, then maybe mid morning, let's say, you, you know, you're eating, you're deciding tomorrow, you're going to eat, you know, past, past noon and, and get like an 18 hour or 16 hour, 15 hour period of not eating. You want to know, has your body converted to burning sugar or to burning fat? One way to do that is to check your ketones. Additionally, after a couple hours of eating, it is kind of nice to see uh, what your blood sugar is. Now, I don't expect everyone to be pricking their fingers all the time, but honestly, if you're in a situation where you are really focusing one on weight loss and two on just optimal health, Anytime your blood sugar spikes after a meal to a, to a very high level, that is a food that probably you shouldn't be eating because anytime your blood sugar spikes, you basically just aged a little bit more, much more than you would have if your blood sugar didn't spike. So, uh, so I do really, really recommend buying a glucometer if you're not going to be able to get insulin or both. If I mean, because ultimately we're talking here, we're not talking about mediocrity in, in, in our health. You know, if you're, if you're on this class, obviously you're interested in really taking control over things and not waiting for your doctor to do it. You're taking control. So ultimately I highly recommend you buy a Keto Mojo device or any other uh, ketone meter that also allows you to check your blood sugar and, you know, think about that. And if you have any questions about how to use it optimally for you, um, definitely reach out to me. Okay, so we've covered the basics of metabolic flexibility. Now let's talk a little bit about the problems that we're having um, and so we can understand that. And we've, we've basically gone through this, you already understand it. Essentially, you get to a point where you can't break down fat. So this excess fuel uh, is basically going to lead to increased deposition of fat due to this, this in, in elevated insulin. So you're in a situation, no matter what you do, you can't break down fat. Uh, until you get this metabolic flexibility down. And this essentially makes you become dependent on meal spacing, um, meaning frequent meals. And this leads to brain fog, mental discomfort, um, you know, an in incredible amount of, of even emotional issues you don't even realize are due to the fact that your, your brain is just not getting the energy it requires because, uh, because when your body liberates ketones, as an example, and your body starts breaking down fat, your brain is capable of using those ketones as supplemental energy. So even though your blood sugar is lower because you haven't eaten, your ketones basically just turn your mind back on. Um, and if you're not able to do that, this is going to lead to all kinds of problems that are making things worse, like binge eating, like, you know, crankiness, like real feelings of, of what a doctor by the name of Joel Furman calls toxic hunger, where you just feel really awful when you are metabolically flexible and you're capable of burning fat and you switch, your body switches, 
again, you don't get cranky. You don't get, uh, you just feel hungry. They feel like you need to eat. Um, and so this is something that this sort of dependence on having meals frequently, something I hear about all the time. Uh, there, there's, there's someone currently that I'm helping out that, uh, that tried to do fasting and really got incredibly, just felt incredibly sick. And that is essentially what's going on here. So with her, we're basically, I'm basically recommending that, you know, she just postpone her breakfast by 10 minutes, uh, 10 minutes a day uh, until we can get to a point where her body is slowly, you know, in, the, in her case, she doesn't want to necessarily change what she's eating. She's eating fairly cleanly, but for whatever reason, uh, you know, it'd be nice to get labs, but ultimately we're going to try to space out uh, so that hopefully she can ease into her body being able to switch over to burning, burning fat. And ultimately this wouldn't be a problem evolutionarily because we would, even on a yearly basis, go through a period of time where, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of food around. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we can go to the supermarket and we can buy, you know, pineapples in the middle of winter. And, uh, and un unfortunately, many of us eating in, you know, low nutrient dense foods and processed carbohydrates and, and all kinds of chemicals, obviously it's not, not helping the picture as well. So when you have this metabolic flexibility, unfortunately, one of the problems is, is it can lead to something called metabolic syndrome. And some of the features of metabolic syndrome include high blood pressure. And all this is essentially, you know, a, partly a function of what's happening due to uh, excess, obviously excess food, inability to break down fat, and this spiral that I'm talking about. High blood pressure, obviously weight gain, high blood sugar, high triglycerides, low HDL, the good, you know, the good cholesterol. And, and now uh, they're including elevated liver enzymes because people are getting essentially fatty, fatty livers as a response, as, you know, as a consequence of, of some of the, the pattern that we're, we're seeing here. And unfortunately, um, although this isn't necessarily indicative solely of, of fatty liver disease, the epidemic of fatty, fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver uh, disease is, is unfortunately a terrible, terrible problem. And this is very recent. I mean, even when I was in medical school, I remember um, that non-alcoholic um, fatty, anytime fatty liver was mentioned, we all always assumed that, you know, it was, it was an alcoholic. And then um, during medical school, it was this rare phenomenon at the time, or at least it seemed that way, of uh, this condition called non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease. And now it's absolutely incredibly uh, prevalent and it's like an epidemic. Uh, it's, it's happening even in children. I had, a, I remember I had this patient who he was, I mean, a kid, he was seven or eight. And he was, um, I mean, he was, I, I, he was the weight of a, of a, of, of a big adult, essentially. Uh, he was seven or eight years old. And he had uh, fungal infections through on all his nails, uh, both his fingers and his, and his toes. Um, and so we were, I was going to treat him with oral antifungals. And I got his, um, his enzymes, because we needed to check his enzymes, and they were all elevated. And um, I couldn't treat him. Um, and his, his pediatrician was completely incapable of getting the family enrolled into an educational program to control and help his obesity. And unfortunately, again, I was, I was actually unable to treat him. So, and it turns out, I've, I've heard numerous reports, and unfortunately, this is, this is a problem that, that we're seeing. So from a clinical perspective, um, people are getting trunkal weight gain and fatigue. Um, obviously, all those symptoms we spoke about with metabolic flexibility, uh, for some of those people, they're also getting, getting this as well. So this is a problem. And one of the, one of the issues is, you know, uh, you have to have multiple, you have to have a certain number of these to be able to be, quote, diagnosed as having metabolic syndrome. But metabolic syndrome is unfortunately associated with, you know, a much higher mortality rate, shorter lifespan, you know, usually leads to full-blown diabetes. It's, it's, it's this overall inflammatory state through the entire body. 
and it can be essentially reversed if you can restore some of the metabolic flexibility that we're speaking about. Uh, no, no discussion of what we're talking about here would be complete without really talking about obesogens. Now these are basically the most common one is endocrine disrupting chemicals that we have in our environment, which can prevent you from being able to, because they're simulating uh, hormones, they prevent you from, potentially prevent you from breaking down fat as well as inter interfering with the, the delicate hormonal balance of your body. And unfortunately, some of these can be fetal uh, exposures as well. They can, they can unfortunately predispose you to having metabolic issues later in life, one being fetal nicotine. They've shown, uh, unfortunately, is associated with some blood sugar irregularities in, in adults, believe it or not. Um, phthalates, we've spoken about before, but these are plastics, sometimes found in cosmetics. These can also interfere. BPA, which you know, you often, there's also um, other types of BPA as well, um, and we're you know, in the same family, essentially. And, you know, these, these are, it's often, you probably have seen like BPA free cans, uh, any sort of acidic product that's in a can, especially tomato products are often lined with BPA. Um, so whenever you're buying tomatoes in a can, you do want to look for a BPA free can. Uh, obviously, if you can buy in glass for, for tomato products, it's probably a better situation. And it's also found in receipts. So I've, we've spoken about that before. There's actually, you actually get, I know it sounds kind of nutty to, to be, you know, if people look at you, <laughs> look at you funny if you're, you know, not wanting to touch your receipts, but you should probably be aware of the fact that these are directly associated with, uh, with obesity. So, um, but any of the like shiny receipts from, from, you know, from anything, from when you're shopping at the store and such, uh, have actually a lot of BPA on them. Um, and so if you're crinkling them in your hand, you actually get a decent, unfortunately you get a decent dose. Uh, I know that sounds kind of kind of crazy, the, the world that we've created around us. This is just a small selection of, of them. There's, there's plenty more. Ultimately, you know, if you can avoid storing your food in plastics, uh, that's probably the best. You know, I recommend people storing their food in glass if they can. You know, the they make the uh, you know like the the Tupperware type of things. You know, you can buy them in glass. I do recommend people switching. Ultimately, you have to realize that you get more of a release of the toxins from the plastic. You know, if you're putting them through the dish the heated dishwasher all the time, they start to break down. So glass is always going to be a better storage uh, mechanism. So just something to be aware of. Again, you can drive yourself nutty over all these things. Uh, I don't, I'm, my intention is not to, to make you feel like everything is, is crazy. Just, it's something that honestly, I think you should just be aware of. And, you know, switching to glass is, is not, not such a big deal. Um, just something to think about. Okay, so we, we're moving now on to lifestyle factors that are going to, to both contribute and help the situation. And we'll talk about sleep, exercise, meal timing, and fasting. Now, sleep is becoming, you know, we're just learning so much about sleep. And it's really something that you have to pay attention to. Um, the disruption of sleep is going to lead to all kinds of different things. So altered eating patterns, uh, weight gain, definitely night workers are, are unfortunately have a much higher, um, much higher rates of diabetes. And that's something that, and they also have unfortunately uh, a lot of other problems, including uh, decreased um, life expectancy, people who work at night, unfortunately. So there is something powerful about really respecting the, the, the your sleep and respecting the circadian rhythms because ultimately every part of our body has a, an all, has a circadian rhythm to it. Even your skin, believe it or not, if your skin is is constantly being barred by blue light, you know, by you know LED lights, and you know you have your phone up against your face, and you know you're constantly looking at screens, you know your body, your skin actually goes into a repair mode 
in the dark when it's not being exposed to, to blue lights that are unfortunately all over the place these days. And that actually, that actually causes your skin to age a lot faster because uh, it's not going through the, the rest cycle. And the same thing can be said about every single organ in your body. And sleep is the ultimate sort of trigger to your body. But we need to realize that sleep doesn't start at sleep. In other words, it starts when the sun goes down. When the sun goes down, your body releases uh, melatonin in preparation for, for sleep. So if the melatonin is not released early, just as the sun goes down, then you're going to have trouble sleeping. And what interferes with the melatonin being released? Excess light, excess blue light. So again, we're talking about LED lights, you know, and almost all lights that are not from the old incandescent bulbs are going to, the old incandescent bulbs aren't going, they don't, they have very little blue light in them, but all the modern day lighting is unfortunately filled with blue light, including the light that I'm using to light myself up here, uh, loaded with blue light. And that is going to interfere with the melatonin that is naturally released shortly after the sun went down. Now think about it years ago when everyone was sitting around the, the you know, the fire, um, you know, the, that, that's not going to interfere with your, your sleep because of the wavelengths of light that are released. But nowadays it's, it's, you know, we're just flooded with light and that's going to interfere with things. So it's something to be conscious of, maybe keep your lights a little bit dimmer than usual. If you have, if you have LEDs, uh, as the sun goes down, things should get a little darker so that the natural rhythm of your body getting it ready to, for sleep is, is happening. Um, less than seven hours per night of sleep in adolescence was associated with increased abdominal obesity and NHANES data, which is a massive compendium of health related data. Um, it said that those who had the most sleep also had the best body composition. So there are so many things about sleep that we're learning about. And it's like every month there's new incredible information about how important sleep is. And, you know, it's, it's something that you really should invest your time in, into is, and the way you do that is thinking about circadian rhythms, thinking about the natural rhythms of the day. That's, that's really how you do it. And of course, we'll talk more about that. Okay, so uh, exercise, of course, is going to be, be helpful. Uh, again, insulin again uh, comes up because first of all, if you're, you're going to have increased insulin sensitivity with exercise, which means that you know, your body is utilizing it in, in, in the proper way. And it's not, going to have, it's not going to have to release as much because you're more sensitive to it, which lowers your insulin level. Think about that. If your body is more sensitive to it, it doesn't need to get reach a higher level before, you know, the, before, you know, it's like pressure to, to turn a, to flick a switch on, like, you know, it's going to, it's going to go easier. It doesn't, it's sensitive. So any kind of, uh, especially if you're using your muscles, doing resistant resistance work, that is going to increase the insulin sensitivity because, because of the use of the muscles. And that's going to ultimately lead to a situation where your insulin levels can, can come down. And of course, getting rid of that visceral fat, which we've spoken about before, that surrounds the organs, which is three times more uh, inflammatory than, you know, uh, than usual, is, all, is also going to, to help. And consider taking a walk after dinner because this leads to lower blood sugar in the evening. And if you can get lower blood sugar in the evening, then hopefully by morning, your body is capable of, uh, first of all, the lower the blood sugar, the lower the requirement for insulin. The higher your insulin, the higher your blood sugar spikes, uh, the, the more insulin you need to bring the blood sugar down. If you walk after dinner or after a meal, that's naturally going to lower your blood sugar. So it's just another way to start to slowly get that insulin uh, down. So general principles uh, that you should ask yourself when it comes to exercise is, are you including all of these in your, in your per week? You know, so there's resistance work. You can do body, body weight exercises, you know, um, anything like Pilates or, or yoga is, is considered resistance because you, you're, doing poses and you're, and you're stressing the muscles. Uh, obviously, you know, weights, weights are, you know, good for everyone. Um, they are, 
you know, even in, in elderly people, it's shown an enormous improvement in strength, you know, after just a short period of time. So any, so some kind of resistance work you need to do. Next is short but higher intensity. And you only need to do this, you know, most experts say maybe 20 minutes per, twice a week is, is really enough, which basically means, you know, just get to a point where your body is out of breath for just a short period of time, 30 seconds to a minute, and then take a break and then do it again. Um, obviously talk to your doctor, see if you're capable of going to a situation where you're a little bit um, out of breath. And the way you define sort of um, being out of breath, one way is if you're talking and you know you can't like talk uh, smoothly, that's sort of like you're, you're reaching that point. Uh, so you want to do that, again, no more than, than, than twice a week, just for, again, 20 minutes, 20 minutes being the total amount of time. Maybe, you know, you get your, your heart rate, uh, you know, you're out of breath a little bit, again, for 30 seconds or so, and then you take a break. Maybe you do that, you know, five times, 10 times, whatever you can do. And you, you can slow, again, talk to your doctor to see if you can do that. Next is long walks. You should work up. A lot of people, times I actually... Uh, who people who haven't exercised in a long time, I tell them, try to get up to a one hour walk, like a full one hour. If you can do that, you know, you're really getting to a point where you are, you know, it, 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 it is so important to do that because your body adapts to walking. We spoke about this at one of the classes several, probably a month ago, where we spoke about uh, all the science behind walking and how we were probably evolutionarily designed to, to walk. And one of the ways that, that this guy that wrote this book, I think the book's called In Praise of Walking, is that when people are doing like the Appalachian Trail and they're walking, you know, 2000 miles or whatever, believe it or not, within a span of, you know, one or two weeks only, people who can get up to a point where they're walking, you know, five to 10 hours a day, um, even if they hadn't trained for, for the walk, Obviously they were in general, general good health. But the point I'm trying to make is that our bodies are adapted to be able to walk long distances. Um, and so therefore, you know, it, it's like positive feedback. You know, ultimately the first time you do a one full one hour walk, if you haven't done that, you realize how much how long that is and how much activity it actually is. But within a week or two, you're, you're easily capable of doing it. And this provides a lot of positive feedback for people that they feel much better. Of course, their blood sugar is much better. And so starting with walk, the walk, walking by far is going to be the best thing you can do for yourself. Uh, there's no question about it. And the countries that walk the most have, you know, have an incredible, incredibly much higher, you know, much lower risk of obesity. Um, and they've been able to correlate all kinds of metabolic Dam damage to, to cities where the average walking time is really, really low. There's certain countries like, example, Japan and Tokyo, the average person walks 7,500 steps per day. That's several, several miles. Um, and in different countries that are walking, walking cities, you know, the health overall is, is much better. So the more, the, more you, the more you can, again, if you haven't been doing a lot of exercise, don't worry, don't go crazy about figuring out how you're going to start lifting weights and, you know, doing high intensity, you know, bursts, just start walking. It's going to be the best thing that you can do. And then you'll feel so much better. You're going to want to start exercising more. Um, so, and then flexibility, which is something that I, even I have to remind myself to work on. Uh, so all of these are going to be things that you really should keep, keep track of. All right, so meal timing. Um, again, meal timing is essentially like I, what I said before. Just follow the natural rhythms of the day. You know, you're not gonna wanna eat late into the evening because think about it from the perspective that I spoke about. The sun goes down. The second the sun goes down, your body is preparing itself because of the rise of mel melatonin to lead to, uh, to sleep. So it doesn't make sense for you. Your body is switching from, from this active phase to the resting phase. It makes no sense to eat in, in that situation because you're, you, you should be digesting, you know, you should be uh, resting. You're getting ready to go into sleep. So you shouldn't be eating very, very late in the day. Um, 
just match, match, respect the natural rhythms of the body. Fasting, we'll go briefly through all the different kinds of fasting, but ultimately you now understand why fasting is important because it mimics something that we evolutionarily, evo you know, we evolved to go through periods of fasting. Um, and so in modern day, I think it's important for us to come up with some sort of plan to be able to do that. Every, I always am fond of saying that every culture around the world, every religion has incorporated some sort of fasting. And while they speak of it as a, you know, a spiritual discipline, uh, and you do understand why that is when, when you enter ketosis and, you know, your brain is in just a, a different, different place, ultimately, um, maybe there is some sort of evolutionary, you know, uh, intuition, I guess, when it comes to fasting. So biological fasting is uh, otherwise known as fasting mimicking diet. It's a five-day reduced calorie diet. It's part of the program that I have called the Body Mastery Method, where people do this for five days a month to be able to basically get to a point where day three, you are in keto, day, actually usually the end of day two, day three, you're definitely in ketosis. And again, it's not a ketogenic diet. It's just getting a five-day period where your body is getting used to, again, uh, its natural ability to be able to burn fat. Um, and you do this you know, five days a month for three months, and it's very effective at restoring metabolic flexibility. Um, so if you're interested in, in that, of course, we have that program available. Reach out to me at any time, and I can give you more information about that. Um, if you are interested, go to Dr. Uh, chatwithdrcarp.com, uh, and I'd love to talk to you more about that. Okay, time-restricted feeding. So basically, you are uh, narrowing the, the window of eating. So maybe you're going to eat from 12 to, you know, maybe you're going to eat from noon to, you know, 6 p.m. So that's a six hour eating window, which means, you know, that you have a much larger period of, of time where you're not eating. And this can also help with restoring your ability to switch over from burning sugar to burning fat. Intermittent fasting, which is usually fasting for, you know, one to three days. Um, I wouldn't, honestly, I don't recommend people do that, do more than, more than a day, um, unless you've discussed it with your doctor. Uh, usually one, especially if you're on diabetes, med if you're on any sort of high blood pressure or diabetic medications, you definitely need to talk to your doctor about doing any sort of, of fasting. These that can lead to low blood sugar, low, as well as low blood pressure, which can of course lead to, to passing out and hitting your head. You definitely want to talk to your doctor if you're interested in that. Uh, a 24 hour fast, you know, is, is fabulous for a lot of people to just incorporate some kind of fasting. But if you're with well, the benefit of biological fasting is you get to eat, eat food, a reduced amount, but for five days without having to worry about not just going without food. Alternate day fasting. Uh, some people do this as a sort of a weight loss type of thing where they eat one day and then they, they don't eat the next day. Um, there's various, there's an alternate day modified fast where they have like one small meal in the, you know, they eat one day, then they have one small meal the next day. And then, um, again, I, I don't think you need to do either of these, but, um, I think biological fasting is fabulous. And I think, you know, doing a one day fast, you know, sometimes one, depending on the, on your goals could be one day a week, could be, you know, one day a month, whatever, whatever the case is. Uh, 552, which was a very popular program for a while. I think it's still might be popular where you eat for five days and fast for two. Sometimes it's like Monday through um, a Monday they'll fast and Thursday they'll fast. Other people do like Saturday and Sunday they fast. Um, and, you know, ultimately people are seeing, are you doing these to lose weight? Not necessarily to, to, to you know, restore metabolic flexibility, but that certainly can help. And then I put calorie restriction under fasting only because I couldn't think of another place to put it. It's not really fasting, but there are people who eat very nutrient dense. Uh, well, there are people who restrict calories. Um, there are several problems with calorie restriction and it's not uncommon. It, in fact, it's more common than not for people to unfortunately be under eating and really not getting the nutrient density that's required. And if you're under eating and not getting all the nutrients you, you get, you're not putting yourself 
in a, a healthy situation because if you're going to to not eat a lot, um, you one it can damage your your metabolism in a sense that when you do eat higher levels of calories, your body you know you've gone through this period of time for so long, and then when you eat, you know your body just grabs everything it it can possibly take. Uh, that doesn't seem to happen when you're eating an incredibly nutrient dense diet. What does that mean? Lots of leaf, leafy greens, you know, nuts, seeds, like all those things that have an enormous phytochemical rich um, background to them. And when you do that, uh, generally you're not as hungry. And, you know, again, I don't, I'm not recommending calorie restriction, but there are people who do it very effectively, um, but it's not something I generally recommend. But I put it in here because generally speaking, a slightly a slight caloric restriction, just ever so slight, um, is is fine. But if you and can be very very healthy, if you do it, paying really close attention to nutrient density, and that is going to, you know, I've seen that do amazing amazing things, from reversing lupus to so reversing psoriasis, all kinds of things can happen along with uh, weight gain, I'm sorry, weight loss, and a whole host of other metabolic, um, you know, improvements. So um, probably the most, most famous person that sort of advocates sort of like a, not calorie restriction, but slight calorie restriction with nutrient density is uh, the doctor I mentioned earlier uh, by the name of Joel Furman. Okay. So we have basically covered everything that I wanted to speak about. And the questions, it comes, so how do we get back to this amazing ability of our bodies? I mean, really think about how incredible it is that we are capable. I mean, you don't tend to think of it this way, but it's amazing that our bodies can put down fat and that we can liberate it when we, are, when we need it. And that's an amazing thing. Unfortunately, as we've spoken about, We've, a lot of us have gotten to a point where unfortunately we have this fat and we can't get rid of it. And so that's why this concept of metabolic flexibility is so incredible in the sense that it gives you a frame of mind to be able to understand the problem, you know, in a very clear way so that, you know, maybe it allows you to come up with some solutions that you can do for yourself. So what are the questions you need to ask yourself? Uh, when it comes to diet, uh, you have to realize that you have to look at nutrient density. So there's something called the Andy score. In fact, uh, probably week eight or nine, I did a whole talk on nutrient density. And we spoke about how, you know, leafy greens, nuts, seeds, these are very nutrient dense. There are certain uh, nutrient dense uh, organs, you know, liver, liver comes to mind where you're getting, you know, a fair amount of, of natural uh, preformed vitamin A as well as vitamin D. Um, you don't need a lot of it. I'm certainly not recommending people eating, eat large quantities of, of organs, but if you're thinking about nutrient density, definitely small, por very small portions of some organs could, can, could be classified. Uh, but ultimately, most of the nutrient density is going to become coming from the plant kingdom because when you look at it as a ratio of calories to nutrients, you're always going to get per calorie, more nutrients packed in it from, you know, from, uh, you know, leafy greens. That's just the, that's just how it is. Processed food. Remember, I spoke about how pro most experts agree that it's probably 10 to 20% of the population that can handle uh, a little bit of processed food. Uh, and it, that's sort of a sad, sad state of affairs. Um, but ultimately, you know, we need to get rid of processed foods. So any kind of obviously sugar, um, you know, white, generally most, most flours, but certainly white flour, uh, anything that's been really processed is going to be a, a problem. Obviously processed meats, you know, deli meats and such are, are just, they're not really food, honestly. So you need to think about the amount of processing and just as a general rule, if it's gone through multiple multiple steps. I mean, it's probably not a good, it's probably not something that you're going to want to eat. You know, if your great grandparents didn't eat it, it's probably not, not food per se. And we spoke about those obesogens. So are you maintaining just an awareness of, you know, how clean 
is the food that you're you're eating. Uh, does it have low pesticides? Has it been stored in plastics? Um, these sorts of things. These are the questions you should ask yourself when you're looking overall at your diet. Exercise, does it cover all those elements? Is it covering, you know, again, focus on walking if you haven't been exercising and that will and just be the best thing you could ever do for yourself. A regular walking routine, just incredible. But then, you know, you want to incorporate some muscular activity because you're increasing your insulin sensitivity. Your body is becoming more efficient at what it's supposed to do. You have a lowered general inflammatory state when, you know, sitting down and, you know, all day long, it, it creates inflammation. It's amazing. The body is meant to be moving almost all the time. And if we think about it evolutionarily, it would make sense that, you know, we were, you know, we had to work to, 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 to eat, to provide food, walking and scavenging and, you know, hunter gatherer type things. But even when agriculture was, was incorporated, that continued, that continued, there was constant work. And nowadays, you know, we can sit on our butts and, and, you know, we're working on our computers and, you know, five hours goes by and we haven't moved. That is uh, inflammatory. And because the movement's not happening, that's going to affect your insulin levels. So if you can continually be, be moving or at least incorporating that walking after, after, you know, your dinner, that's always going to be helpful. Um, and then ultimately, you know, ultimately you want to get to a point where, you know, you're doing all those elements and then the circadian rhythm. And now whenever I talk about, you know, uh, recommendations, you know, well, you know, we talk about, you always say, oh, diet and exercise are going to be the best thing. But now it really makes sense to, to say diet, exercise, and circadian rhythm as three equally important sort of uh, pillars of, of overall health. And are you respecting, you know, the light and, and time? And if, and we spoke about that in detail in the sense that, again, we have to be, be respectful of light and its, its inter, interference, interaction with, with our, our melatonin levels. And melatonin, you know, it's a very potent antioxidant. So if you're just not really releasing any, any melatonin, then, you know, it's ultimately uh, affecting your, you know, your inflammatory state as well, because, you know, as your body is going into sleep and it's repairing, you know, it needs a little extra, uh, it needs a little extra antioxidant ability. And, you know, your body is capable of doing that by releasing melatonin. Melatonin also does a whole host of other things, of course, but that is one of the things it does. So that is, that really covers in a very succinct fashion, I believe, um, metabolic flexibility. And uh, we have that amazing article um, by Dr. Nedro to, to thank us for the overall um, outline that, that I used tonight. And so if you wanna go into it a little bit more detail, again, there's, there's the article and you can Google that. And, um, and it's, it's, it's a great article and you'll, you'll get another review of what we basically spoke about. So that's everything I wanted to cover. I think we covered actually quite a bit and I think it gives you some very practical suggestions for thinking about things. If you can get an insulin level from your doctor, or I'm gonna say it again, I almost say it every single week, order your own insulin level. Just get, go get it done. It's, it's not an expensive test. It's probably 30 or $40. And you can go to one of those labs that um, allows you to order your own blood tests, even Quest and, um, LabCorp, which you know, you've all probably used, the two big companies now have a consumer-faced portal or service that allows you to order your own blood test and order your own insulin. If you're having trouble with losing weight or uh, you know, see what your insulin level is. If it's high, you know that you need to work on that or ideally, and, and I would say, um, get a ketogenic, a keto meter, like keto mojo, and see, do a 24 hour fast. And, you know, mid morning, even, you know, after 16 hours, check your ketones and see if you're in ketosis. Uh, check your blood sugar and see how much your blood sugar is going up. Don't wait to be diagnosed by, you know, if, if pre diabetes or pre diabetes runs in the family, you know, you can 
of course, get, get the blood test I always speak about called hemoglobin A1C to see your average uh, blood sugar. But you also wanna know if your blood sugar is spiking for some reason. Maybe you, after you eat something, you feel a little bit off. Um, it could be your blood sugar is spiking. So these are the things that ultimately excite me because it means that you're taking a little bit more of a con control over your own health. Um, and you know, public health is always gonna focus on sort of these mediocre uh, suggestions that are sort of averaged out for the entire population. You can't rely on that for optimal health. You have to really take control of things, become, as I always say, become your own authority on these subjects. And that's really what gets me excited about these uh, lectures, because I hope that after going through a class like this, it gives you a little bit of the, you know, of an incentive to really do these sorts of things, uh, not just the lifestyle things, but the, but the lab the labs as well, because if you really can follow the labs, you, you really know what if, you know, ultimately it gives you, you know, probably an 85, 90% idea of if you're on the right track. And, you know, a lot of us aren't clear about that. So don't be afraid to order your own blood test. And, you know, if, if you're having trouble looking at the, at the test, reach out to me. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to either point you to, to someone locally, uh, or, or at least give you some, some articles or guidance. Uh, and that's ultimately what, uh, what excites me. So I hope it excites you that, you know, you are capable of doing this for yourself. And next week, you know, this, this is sort of part one of talking about metabolism, because what we just spoke about has led to understanding this at a deeper level has actually led to sort of a, a mind, a, a, what I would say is a fairly significant revolution in the treatment of cancer. It's called what's been termed the metabolic treatment of cancer. And next week, we're going to be discussing that. And what you're going to find is that this metabolic flexibility that we're speaking about and the ability to switch and move over to burning uh, fat can be critical in, in cancer survival and cancer in general. And, and in fact, um, I'll just end it here. In fact, you know, they've, they've actually done studies to show that pe when people are fasting, um, for, and we'll, of course, we'll go into this in detail next week when they're fasting for like a day or two before chemotherapy, the chemo works dramatically better. And there's a whole society, a whole, um, there's an organization that I'll introduce you to uh, next week that, um, will work with an oncologist to, to help incorporate some of these strategies because the, the amazing improvement in the efficacy of the chemo is, is incredible. So that's a very interesting topic and I'll be introducing that to you next week. So thank you everyone for your attention and uh, I look forward to seeing you next week. Stay well, um, find out your local lab and how you can order your own tests. That's the homework for tonight if I had to give you one and I wish everyone good, good health and um, I'll see you next week. Good night.